Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Janet Yang Rohr, and I'm so excited to be here with, with you all today. Uh, I uh, am the state representative for the 41st district, which includes uh, the Naperville and Warrenville area. Uh, this month, we are meeting with some of our local experts from Naper Settlement. Uh, Naper Settlement is truly one of the, the crown jewels of, of Naperville. And um, we're going to be exploring just some of the opportunities and the new exhibits that are available to our community. Uh, some of these exhibits have been made possible through state capital improvement dollars, uh, things that I and Senator Elman and um, Governor Pritzker have been working on. Um, to, to secure funding for, for these projects. And so we are so fortunate tonight to be joined by three of Naper Settlement's uh, executives and leaders. And they're gonna share with us some of the, the really exciting things that are happening at, at Naper Settlement. Um, you know, let me introduce my three guests today. Uh, I'm gonna give each of you uh, just a chance to share with our audience your role at Naper Settlement, uh, including maybe some of the responsibilities that you have. I know, I know you all wear many different hats. And um, if you could just tell, tell us a little bit about yourselves, what you do there and how long you've been at Naper Settlement, that, that'd be uh, awesome. So first, let me introduce to the audience, Reina Tamayo Cabrese, who is the president and CEO of Naper Settlement. Reina, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, it is always a pleasure. Thank you so much for giving the opportunity um, for us to speak about the wonderful place that we have here in Naperville. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you. And uh, next, Donna Sack, uh, you are the Vice President and Chief Program Officer at Naper, Naper Settlement, right? Absolutely, and I have the real pleasure of working with um, so many of our teams to pull our to pull our content and to help drive the direction of what we're collecting and I work on quite a number of special projects as well and um, I've actually been at Naper Settlement um, twice uh, my, I was there first from the uh, early 1990s until about 2010. I became the executive director of the Association of Midwest Museums, the Illinois Association of Museums, and then um, was really excited by everything that was uh, going on and uh, came back in 2016. So we jokingly refer to that as my first term and my second term. So I've seen a lot of time. That's excellent. Um, I, I'm sure you'll have a lot of really uh, nice uh, little tidbits to, to share with us today. Uh, and, and finally, we have Jean Schultz Angel. Um, Jean is the Associate Vice President of, of Naper Settlement. And, and Jean, tell us what, what, what else that, that entails. Sure. And thank you so much for inviting um, us today. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so as Associate Vice President, I lead the Curatorial and Learning Experiences Departments. So that really is the stuff and the stories at Neighbor Settlement, right? As Donna loves to say. Um, it's the collections, the interpretation, the educational programs, the public programs, um, and everything in between. So really the items we have, the archive, the collection, and then all the programming we do um, with the history of Naperville and the stories we tell. All right. And so with that, let's let's just jump right in. Uh, so first, uh, some of the things that I'm, I'm really excited about to, to learn more about and to share with the audience is uh, about some of the capital projects that are going on, um, in particular, the the innovation gateway. I think that's a that, that's a really exciting, uh, exciting project. And, and Raina, can I ask you to just give us an overview of, of some of those projects at Naper Settlement? Um, you know, what are what are you embarking on? And and, uh, and maybe, you know, where, who, who are you partner, partnering with? Where is that, that funding coming from? Um, thank you, sure. We started uh, about, oh, I don't know, seven years ago or so. Um, there was a, a vision change and that change was for the museum to become a campus of lifelong learning, discovery and fun for all people. And in working towards that goal, one of the things that we really wanted to do was to also make sure that we told the story all the way through today. And so we embarked on um, an important endeavor to tell the 20th century history because we had for almost 50 years been telling the story of the 19th century. And so as we began to delve into 
trying to figure out how to tell the 20th uh, century history, you can understand we can't bring another, you know, five buildings in that would be representative of the 20th century the way that we did with um, our 19th century history. And so one of the things that um, uh, we started looking at was, well, how do we do this? And we obviously, as you know, today, people truly engage through technology. They learn through technology. And we said, okay, if we can find a way to bring that technology so that we can tell the story of the 20th century through technology, where would we put it? Um, and so it gave birth to uh, the idea of Innovation Gateway. Uh, Innovation Gateway essentially is a new welcome and education center at Naper Settlement. Um, from, a very, from a very practical perspective, we also had a difficulty because we don't, we don't have a place to gather, let's say a uh, hundred guests in one, in one place for um, a, a forum, a, a teaching. We didn't have room for um, lunch rooms for our classes that came. So we had some real practical problems in addition to this desire to tell that 20th century history. And so Innovation Gateway now serves that dual function, um, a way to easily process people in, because again, from a very um, practical perspective, we have one residential size door at the preemption house through which we process 296,000 visitors every year. Um, Innovation Gateway allows us, allows us that large open space where we can really um, use it in a lot of different, a lot of different ways, whether it's um, to process people for an event, whether it's just to come and see the museum, or whether it's a symposium on, on an educational topic. So um, we're super excited to, to add Innovation Gateway and the centerpiece, the exhibition centerpiece for Innovation Gateway will be a digital exhibit experience uh, that we call D. Uh, and through that digital exhibit, we will be able to truly showcase the change makers, the history makers, uh, of our community, and we will also be able to hear from them directly. Uh, it is the, the digital wall, um, as we call it, literally spans the length of a wall, and it's a touch uh, screen, so you literally can move the images up and down around. You can, um, you can look through time, you can look um, through just a variety of of interests and move the screens according to um, what your interest is. And so this will be a huge game changer, not only because we'll have the screen at Naper Settlement, but we'll also have a mobile component that will go to the schools and community centers, senior um, centers, et cetera. And of course, uh, all of this will be up on our website. And it's a wonderful thing because, and I'll say this on the, the sort of finally as an introduction, it also allows our uh, community to actually help us curate history. So they will be able to go into this digital exhibit through their homes and actually contribute uh, the, their own history, and we will then upload it. Obviously, there 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 will be you know backstops, but this really does allow us to do two things. It allows us to bring so much of the um, materials that we have in our archives to the front, and it also allows people to contribute things that are their heirlooms or perhaps that are their family history uh, without necessarily having to part with it. And then through all that, we develop a variety of school programming as we have um, over the last, I don't know, 50 years. So it's very exciting times. Um, that's one of them. And then the other one is the Agricultural Interpretive Center, which will focus on our agrarian roots, as well as look forward and serve as a, um, as, as a starting point to get kids interested and excited about STEM education because 
um, today, agriculture is basically all STEM. It's, and we will have along with the Ag Center, we will have a, st a STEM lab through which we will also be developing a variety of um, uh, programming for uh, school children for the summer, et cetera. So really exciting times. That, that really does sound exciting. Um, you know, so, so Innovation Gateway, maybe stay on that for a sec. So it sounds like it'll be very interactive. Um, you know, when, when we've talked about it in the past, you've talked about it as a chance for people to, um, to become part of history. Is, is that what you mean when, when you're talking about like people uh, submitting things and submitting their own artifacts? Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, Yes, absolutely. It is. It gives us the opportunity, really, for our entire community to um, to to be able to use this software that creates a almost like a digital model of the city, the surrounding areas, and it contains just an assortment of um, buildings, streets, landscapes, events, people. And they, it creates a 3D collage, if, if you can picture that. And then you can explore that through the touchscreens um, and you can actually delve down because it allows you to go down into layers and get more information. And so, for example, um, if, um, if you take, I don't know, let's say a Pam Davis, who at one point was um, the, the ED for um, Edward Hospital. Well, perhaps if you're looking at a story about health, you may find her there. But if you're looking for a story about women, you may also find her there. Um, and so it allows really for you to be able to move history. And then the interesting part is if let's say you're a health professional and you or your grand parent was a health professional, you may end up finding that story that you submitted in, in, in the health theme, for example. Um, and as I said, the great part of it is that it, it will be born digital and it will live uh, digital and it will be available certainly to everyone here in our state as well as uh, globally. And that mobile unit is so critical uh, because, you know, this, the school field trip model is not something that schools are all the way comfortable with um, just yet. And some perhaps are too far to, to be able to come to us because they can't do it in a day. So that mobile unit allows us to go to their schools and be where they're at. Got it. And so should residents, for example, start collecting those, those stories, those artifacts, and start thinking about what they want to submit? I think so, absolutely. I know Jean and Donna can help me out here, but absolutely, yes. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's an important way for us to democratize our collection and our stories, and to also get the history. Imagine 50 years from now, imagine 80 years from now or 100 years from now when you can actually see the change makers and the history makers telling you their story in their own voice and through their own perspective. Yeah, I love that. I love that D democratizing your collection, uh, telling stories, because in the end, it's like those stories that really connect us, right? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to I think to kind of um, tell that story a little bit, you know, uh, pictures are, are always very nice and, and video and, and we actually have a video that that you, uh, you all put together for us to to talk a little bit about innovation gateway. Um, so I think we're going to try to show that it's a super, super short, like in a two minute video. I don't know if we can get the sound on this.
Now, I'm not sure if we got the sound on that, but we can fix that in post-production if we need to. But I think what was really striking about it was you can really just see that that juxtaposition of old and new and 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 you can really see um, how how neighbor settlement is 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 changing and updating and and really reflecting i think the 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 diversity and and just just uh, just just what this community has has become and um it looks it looks really exciting to me well and the part you have to you know we we take into account is that we got here somehow and that's really the story that we're telling because the Naperville that we know today and the Naperville that we all understand, um, and actually the communities even larger than that, um, were really things that were planned for us 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years for, uh, ago. And we are living the consequences of those decisions, the great ones and the not so great ones. And so we see that history has an important place in the present because the next 50 years or the 30 years from now that will be the present for someone else in our community. And so um, these are very, very important lessons for us in understanding what our role is vis-a-vis -vis our, our present right now and the future that we will, um, that we will deliver for residents in our community. And I think that's a really good transition to um, kind of just a, maybe a deep dive into one of the, the ex exhibitions that are coming up. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Donna. Um, if maybe could you give us a, a kind of a, an understanding of the unvarnished exhibit? Uh, you know, would love to know more about its origins and kind of the, the research and the connection to, to, to Naperville and, and cities all across the United States of, of this exhibit. Sure, well, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this upcoming exhibit. I think it's um, especially um, germane right now in April when it's Fair Housing Month, right? So um, this is a great time to, to talk about our upcoming exhibit. Um, this exhibit actually was uh, funded in 2017 by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Naper Settlement received um, a significant grant, um, half a million dollars with a half a million dollar in-kind match. So um, this project is uh, quite extensive. It's taken us over five years. And the premise really was to look into the histories of segregation, specifically housing segregation across the Northern and Western United States. Um, so often we think about segregation as being a Southern problem. Um, and when museums and, um, and uh, history organizations have, have, looked at, have looked at this, we wanted to go much, much deeper. Um, and we pulled together uh, five other communities to, as a, as a group, look into our histories of housing, um, housing discrimination, um, because it's known that housing discrimination uh, was rampant. It was systemic across the Northern and Western United States. And we also knew that Naperville was a sundown town. And uh, Sundown Town is a community that is uh, all white on purpose. And if you are a person of color, um, you were welcome to work during the day, for example, but then by, um, by nightfall, you needed to be out of the community. The extensive nature of these practices, uh, one, one um, sociologist has estimated that in Illinois, um, up until the 1970s, 70% 70 of communities of over a thousand people were all white on purpose by design. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about very, very extensive, um, an extensive system and an extensive series of practices. Um, so we invited five other museums, 
to go down the journey with us. Uh, West Hartford, Connecticut is one of the communities. Appleton, Wisconsin, uh, Columbus, Ohio, Brea, California, Oak Park here in Illinois, and then of course, Naperville. Uh, and we've worked together over these past three years. We've worked with scholars. We've done deep, deep levels of, of research. We have done a variety of different oral histories. We've really, really dug into the history. And what we knew from the onset is that all of our communities practiced exclusion of some form or another. What that looked like and how that was practiced and how it played out um, differed depending on exactly where you were in the country, exactly who was in the area, for example. Um, when you look at West Hartford, there was exclusion between Christian and Jewish neighborhoods. When you look at Appleton, Wisconsin, um, they really started digging into their history uh, recently. Uh, African Heritage Inc. is the, is the organization, their cultural organization that we're working with. About Seven years ago, they worked with their local historical society to um, talk about the history of the Black experience in Appleton. And they thought that what they were going to find is that the Black experience was fairly new, right, from the 1990s. What they found was that there was a thriving Black community in Appleton in the late 19th and very early part of the 20th century. And that community essentially was driven out um, in the in the 19 teens and the community became all white. Um, so as we look at these histories, Columbus, Ohio was a place of, um, of a thriving black community with, um, with the great migration. So how we looked at these stories, we really, really dug deep into them and were extremely fortunate to have received this funding um, through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. But it's also important to mention that through this process, we did extensive research, um, audience research, teacher research, and uh, the teacher research in part was funded by the Healing Illinois grant program um, from 2021. And this is, um, is this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is this the first online exhibit for, for Neighbor Settlement? This will be the first online exhibit. Um, I think that it's really going to surprise everyone, the depth of it. I would say for all of the participating organizations, this is the first time that any of us has had this extensive in an online experience. So you literally will be able to spend hours on this on this exhibit and we don't expect people to do that all in a row we expect that people will come into it they will um they'll explore it they may come back uh we do have a significant teacher resources section as well one of the things that we heard loud and clear on a national level is that teachers also need to understand this history, how it came about, how our, communi how our communities became segregated, and then also how change began to happen, right? So I think Raina teed it up really well when she was talking about the Innovation Gateway. Uh, when you look at Naperville and Naperville's history, and when you look at the expansion of our content that we're doing into the 20th and 21st century history, we really needed to take a deep look at how did the community grow? What were the forces that happened? How, how was this, how was this um, set up so that now we're the, we're, uh, we're the third largest city in the state? Our demographics are very, very different today than they were in 1970. Um, and so this really offers us an opportunity to do a deep dive and to share this history uh, with our community and with, um, and with folks on a national level as well. So when people go into this exhibit, there will be articles, there will be ex what we like to refer to as explainer videos. So topic videos. For example, uh, people have heard a lot about redlining, which is um, 
a, a practice that came about um, because of the uh, Homeowners Loan Corporation. And it's one of the practices, one of the real estate practices that help to segregate our communities, but there's many others. Uh, restricted covenants uh, were often put on properties. It may have been put on the land, it may have been put on the house, it may be a singular house, it might be an entire neighborhood. Um, and so one of the things that we're really looking at is what are the forms of those practices? So in Naperville, uh, there was widespread use of restricted covenants. There was widespread use of real estate steering. Um, and so we are looking at those practices and then saying, okay, th those, those happened. What happened to cause change um, to make the shift, right? And we, um, we know that in 1968, there was the significance of the Fair Housing Act, but we go even deeper, even deeper into the story. I, I am so. super excited to hear more about that because um, I, I think we were discussing before uh, just this this past um, legislative session, um, my my seatmate, uh, Rep Representative Dan Didich, he actually uh, sponsored uh, House Bill 58, and it, it's a it's a bill that that I voted for, and, and actually everyone in the House voted for it, passed unanimously, um, and it has to do with those those um, restrictive covenants and um, I guess those modification of, of deeds. Can can you maybe talk about what sure what what, what will you be doing with that? Sure, I'd love to. Um, this is. Um, this is an aspect of the exhibit. Um, we are also, I, I should mention, we're going to have an on-site exhibit that will complement the, um, the virtual, the online exhibit. And we are going to be opening both of those in, um, in May next month. And as part of that, we will also offer, as we always do, a series of programs uh, that relate to the exhibit. And one of the things that we're going to do, as you as you talked about the formal name of the of deed modification, um, it's in the vernacular, the common name, it's known as deed scrubbing, right? And there are a number of states um, that have put new legislation on the books so that people can, without spending years and without spending thousands and thousands of dollars, um, they can get the restricted covenant off of the front facing deed. So the deed that you would be given when you went, when you go to your closing, um, your deed could then not have this language on it. Often the language would say Caucasian only. Sometimes it would be very specific to group that, that were excluded. It might say, um, you know, no Jews, or it it might say um, no Chinese people. There were they come in all kinds of um, all kinds of of restrictions, and so what this legislation allows is for people to do some homework about their deed and then take it to their to their local county or whoever oversees um, deed management, and formally for ten dollars have have your deed cleaned up and that restrictive, uh, whether it's ethnically, religiously, um, or racially restricted covenant removed. And so we're going to be offering on a, on a regular basis through the run of the, uh, of the on-site exhibit, we're going to be doing workshops so that if people want to do that preliminary work, and DuPage County is really grateful that we're that we're do it that we're offering these because we will be able to help people to understand how to prep the materials that they need to bring in. Um, and so we're we're looking forward to being able to help people in this way. Uh, we do expect that we are going to find out um, about more covenants that are out there in Naperville that we're not necessarily familiar with right now. Um, we do know that there are entire neighborhoods that had covenants applied. We also know that there's singular houses. So um, we're, we're, um, we're really looking forward to offering these workshops to help people to get their deeds um, cleaned up in this way. That's really amazing. And I, I mean, it's, this is not just a theoretical exercise. This is we can actually see this in yes. Naperville in our area. Um, so is it, so again, if, if people want to like start a 
get ready for this. Is it, do you recommend, should we look at our deeds? Is that how to go about? <laughs> that might be a good place to start. Um, I know that a couple of summers ago, I think it was in 2020, um, the Daily Herald did an article about this project. And we were of course doing, in the process of doing research as we, as we have been for all of these almost four and a half years. And when that article was published, we had people who called us and said, I want to give you a copy of my deed. Um, I've, I've had this for a long time, and I'm just so grateful that you all are doing this work, and they submitted those to the archive. Um, and so I think that, as I mentioned, I think that we're going to have quite a number of folks who are uh, bringing and talking about this subject. I mean, part of the part of the part of the reason that we do this work is so that we all can have a ha can have a common understanding, and then when we have conversations around certain topics in history, or as Raina said, how policy is made and how that can drive the direction of the future. Um, by sharing this history, we have a common language and we understand that there were restrictive deeds on properties, or we understand that some communities didn't welcome people. Um, and so I think that that's a part of, when you talk about the practical aspects as you just did about the legislation, I think that's another really, uh, really uh, high benefit of, of uh, sharing histories. I, I, I really love just how, um... You're, you're taking these exhibits and making them so practical and making them so applicable to, to our everyday lives. I think that um, th that is truly a, a gift, I think, to the community. Uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit at the beginning of this about the, um, the agriculture center and the kind of the, the um, agricultural exhibits. I, I would love to learn more. Um, I was I was so fortunate to be able to be part of the the groundbreaking that that we had uh, that that you all had last year, um, and and maybe Jean, could you give us an overview of those exhibits and and kind of the the progress that that has been made since that groundbreaking? Sure, absolutely. Well, the buildings are being built, so um, it's very exciting. We have two buildings. We have a Thresher Hall, um, uh, and the Thresher Hall actually will hold. Um, the, the 1912 Wood Brothers Thresher machine that was um, gifted to us by the Wheatland Plow, Plow Match Association. And I apologize if um, my connection is um, coming in and out. I hope you can still hear me. Um, and the, great, okay. <laughs> Um, and the Thresher Hall is that that building um, actually acts a somewhat like a giant exhibit case for this really huge piece of um, machinery that was used by many uh, Naperville farmers in the in the first half of the 20th century. Um, a threshing machine is the machine you bring out on the field to separate the grain from the shaft. And um, it was shared among farmers. So the big, the big story around it is this community aspect of farming and this shared experience that farmers had. One farm family probably couldn't afford a machine like that, but when you share it among many, you know, it really shows you how to sustain um, a farm in the in the 20th century and in the 19th century. So it's it's um, so that machine is has got its own sort of space in which we're going to talk about some of those farm families in Naperville, and we're going to talk about some of that legacy and some of that history, and we're going to talk about the the mechanics of a, a threshing machine. And we're going to talk about innovations and things like that. And then, of course, we have the Agriculture Interpretive Center, and that is going to really dive into food production and farm innovations and machinery and the vital role that agriculture plays in the Illinois economy. Um, and we're so, so excited about uh, the STEM lab that's going in that space. Um, we are going to have uh, feeds to farm fields. So you're gonna be able to meet and greet with farmers and, and things like that. So we have all kinds of exciting things in development and in plans uh, for those spaces. The STEM lab is a natural setting um, with, for students to be able to uh, learn more about all the different ways careers touch 
the agriculture industry through Illinois. So at the Bank Family Agricultural Interpretive Center, that's gonna be a space that could potentially inspire future farmers in Illinois and future people who make their careers in farming. Because as students go through, they're gonna be going through field trips and they're gonna be inspired by this industry. And, and they're not, they're, it's not gonna, you know, the, the idea of what a farmer was is gonna sort of be blown out of the water to what farming is today. So it's gonna be a really interesting space that's going to inspire people and make them really curious about um, Illinois agriculture. So we're, we're really excited about that. And, um, and it, there's gonna be some high tech elements to the, to, to the space as well. Um, there's gonna be some uh, connections to farmers is gonna be a strong current. Um, uh, farming evolution, we're gonna go through some of that and we're gonna, we're gonna look at some of those stories um, it, it's, and we're gonna focus in on Illinois farmers, but we're also gonna have that tie into those Naperville farm families. You know, in 1930, we had a population of 3000. Um, and, you know, at that time, most everybody was farming in Naperville and so, you know, there was a huge shift in that 20th century. Um, and, um, and that really, uh, that story has really needs to be told. So that's, that's very exciting. So we're, 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 we're thrilled about the, um, the Herman and Ann Hagman Memorial Thresher Hall that's gonna have that thresher in there and that the bank, um, Agricultural Interpretive Center. So that's exciting. Uh, Raina, did you want to mention more? I do. I think one of the important things to mention is uh, that both of the families that contributed um, and for whom these buildings are built are very integral farming families in our community. Um, both the Hageman family, uh, different branches of the Hageman family, as well as um, as the banks, and in very different ways, you know, the the Hageman family was very traditional in terms of having the land and farming and so forth, and the bank family really focused on the machinery um, used to actually farm, and so their stories are really quite different, although they all come from um, farming backgrounds. But one of the one of the reasons that we got that we became ever so enthralled and excited about this part of the capital campaign, um, I'll tell you, it started with a really wonderful story. We had Wilbert Hageman and his wife, um, Ruth, came to see me and they said, after 150 years, we're closing down the Wheatland Plow Match Association because Naperville is no longer farming. And we're worried that we will be forgotten, that our story will be forgotten. And it's my job. So I wanna to talk to you about this. And so long story short, we started the capital campaign. And as we went out to get educated, and let me tell you, we have met with everybody, with 4-H, with Chicago farmers, with you name them, we've been there. We've traveled the state to get educated. And part of what happened is um, we met with uh, some of the folks at U of I at the ACES School of Agriculture there. And what they told us was, look, Illinois is losing students in ag schools to other states because kids are not getting interested early enough and they don't understand, and more importantly, their parents don't understand that if they're interested in STEM careers, that is in, you know, in IT, in science, in biology, in technology, that they can do it all in agriculture and that there are some amazingly well-paid jobs and careers in these fields, even if they don't wanna be your traditional farmer. And so we don't have that, we don't have that, that um, that place where we can get them interested young enough. And so we kind of raised our hand and said, well, we do. We have 35,000 school children that come to us in second grade and fourth grade and sixth grade and eighth grade and in high school. And maybe there's something that we, that we could do together. 
And it has been, I think, uh, we have had some wonderful conversations with them and with a variety of other institutions, you know, like DuPont, et cetera, around how do we create this pipeline to get kids interested as they move um, through the schooling system. And for us, uh, you know, we have 112 different uh, school districts. Uh, and now hopefully with the digital wall, we'll be able to even expand that some more throughout Illinois so that these STEM careers and the future of agriculture, I mean, after all, you know, it's real simple. No farmers, no food folks, that simple. Um, and so to get that part of an industry that is so important in the state of Illinois um, to ensure that it is thriving and moving towards the future is really, I think, an added benefit to what we're doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I think one of the, the the greatest privileges I have as a state legislator is to see so much of, of what is happening outside of our district. Um, and you know, one of the things, especially that's that STEM connection. We we were able to go um, on a on a combine for corn harvesting, and it, it was amazing. Like the the combine is completely guided by satellites. Uh, we got to talk to farmers about how you know they're they're working with companies to to completely optimize you know their seed production and 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 their output. And and you can just just talking with them, you can really hear like there is there's a lot of um, a lot of engineering, a lot of science, a lot of um, you know exactly what you'll be introducing students to um, in in farming in modern day farming. Exactly, and we're so excited because um, there this is just something that just really isn't out there too much. We're we're really exciting to bring this programming to students um, in in a, in the form of a field trip and in the form of programming for scouts and for other groups. So um, this is gonna be a real connection out to the field. Um, you know, as, as we've all said many times, no farmers, no food, you know, this is vital. It's absolutely vital, so. And I know we've talked about a lot of exhibits already, but there, there's one more, right? They're building <laughs> Naperville? There is. <laughs> so back in June of 2020, uh, we had um, the unfortunate experience of having a water line break um, at Neighbor Settlement. And it happened uh, during COVID. And um, luckily for us, we were on site that day for another uh, reason. And we noticed water going into the basement um, or to the lower level, excuse me, of our, um, of our uh, uh, the preemption house, our lower level exhibit space. And we, got to it in time and um you know we had um some damage and we had inches of water on the floor and uh but but we were fortunately there to mitigate serious damage but there was enough damage so where we had to repair some floors and redo the space the physical space in in a variety of ways which is you know if you're if you're doing that in your house it's pretty simple and straightforward, but if you're doing it in a museum, there's lots of things to consider when you have to empty out um, an exhibit space. We lost Jean. I would be happy to jump in here and continue if you'd like me to until we get her back. Um, what, what that actually provided was, you know, the old. Um, make lemonade out of lemons. Oh, are you back, Jean? I am, and I apologize about that. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, my The internet says it's working, but I, I seem to be going in and out, so I apologize. Um, but yes, uh, we, had, we had to bring everything out and put it all back in, and we thought, why not tell some more stories here and update this exhibit space? One of the main takeaways we had was we decided there's no such thing as a permanent exhibit space anymore. We're going to showcase our permanent collection on exhibit. We have 85,000 items at Aver Settlement. And so to rotate in some of those stories and have places to showcase um, and that would change in and out was really important to us. So there's more screens for oral histories 
there's more pictures up. There's, there's an entire space in the center of the exhibit that we will rotate in annually to showcase some different part of the collection or some other story to tell. So we're all, we're very excited about that. Plus, it allowed us to put some key things on exhibit that we didn't have when, um, when the original exhibit was up, like the Lyceum. That was something added to the collection. It was the debating society from the 1830s and 40s that was in Naperville. So those um, neighbor settlement founders had a debate club and the minutes and what they argued is in those minutes. And it's a very, um, it's a the, very the men bad. had a debate club. Well, yes, of course. But they did debate whether women should be able to debate. <laughs> right. <laughs> So we have a whole section that you can actually activate your debating skills and, you know, form your own lyceum. We also look at transportation in a different way. And, um, you know, there's a whole section on the 20th century boom for Naperville. So, um, and it also showcases a, a, a lot of the people that had come in during the 20th century that had become Naperville residents during the 20th century and showcase some of their history as well. So, so it's, it, it's an exciting thing for us to, um, to showcase all of these new stories, even though it started out with a flood. But we're, we're excited that we got to do that. And one other thing is, again, one of the things that we want to do with uh, the digital exhibit that I talked about a little bit ago is to allow people to tell their stories in their own voice. And one of the things that we're really thrilled about is that in that exhibit, as it was update, we've started to do that. There are now the oral histories of a variety of our, um, uh, our residents that are now living in that exhibit so that you, if you wanna know what it was like in 1960 or 1970, or what was the experience of someone that was coming in like uh, a Nancy Chen um, who came in 40 years ago as I think the first Chinese uh, resident or among the first, uh, you can hear it from her or you can hear the experience of a Betty Worley who uh, married one of the Worleys and came into town from um, the South. So these are really wonderful ways for you to, to engage uh, and to really feel like you are immersed in this history. So, and I will say also this, the exhibit that was created uh, back in, help me out, Donna, probably 1990 something or other, um, because I think it's it was getting on to thirty years. Um, Ninety six was its first was its first opening, and it was open in a series of three different stages. So, yeah, so ninety six, ninety seven. That exhibit was over two million dollars then, or close to two million dollars. Excuse me. Then we, for a fraction of that. Uh, were able to use the insurance money to redo and update that exhibit with the expertise in our in-house with our staff. And they truly have done a tremendous, tremendous job. Um, prouder of the work that they uh, that, that they delivered. And actually, I've had several people tell me, so who did this exhibit for you guys? And, you know, when I say we did it, there, you know, the eyes just kind of go like this. So it's been, um, it's been a wonderful journey for us in so many ways. Um, the whole lemon to lemonade thing, this, this lemonade is pretty darn sweet. I, I am super excited to see that, and um, you know, let let me let me go through some some questions that have come from people watching, and and some some questions that we've gathered. Um, so how, how tell tell us how how can we see these? Um, tell tell us about admissions. Tell us about how um, you know people access the museum. Sure. Um, um, well, admission right now, um, up until April 30th, is $6 for adults, $5 for seniors, and $4 for um, children. Um, members, uh, Naperville residents, um, and um, 
two other categories have reduced or free admission. Members are free, Naperville residents are free, museums for all um, have a reduced admission. And then we also are part of Blue Star um, museums, which are um, allow active duty military in for free as well. Starting May 1st, we enter our summer season. And that's when the buildings, people will be able to go into the buildings um, on campus and be able to explore and get tours of the buildings. And that um, the admission goes up to $12 for adults, seniors are $10 and children are $8. And uh, that's when, that's the time the splash pad also opens uh, on, on site. And so if it's above 70 degrees, the splash pad will be activated as well. But again, members and Naperville residents are are uh, get in for free. So that that splash pad is a favorite in my household. So my youngest is a six year old, but I, I think even the twelve year old likes it. So <laughs> it's quite popular. We like, yeah, we like to say we can tell the time of day by the splash pad because there's two waves of little ones that come in. There's the morning, and then I'm gonna go take my nap wave. And then there's the, I've taken my nap and now I'm coming in in the late afternoon wave. So um, the team really uh, counts on that splash pad to kind of orient us in a, in a summer's day. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about um, programming because there are a lot of uh, like summer programs, right? And just actually programs throughout the year. Oh, absolutely. Camp Naper is our big summer program for children. And um, you know, there's still a few spots available, but if you're looking for a summer camp, check out Camp Naper. Um, it's almost actually sold out. We're so excited about it. Um, we do all different types of camps every week. There's a couple of different offerings for camps. Um, you know, and, and it's not all focused around history, but there's all sorts of history components throughout the camps. So yes, we have a Civil War camp. We also have a Build It camp. We have an architecture camp. We have, you know, a Survive camp. So there's all different types of camps, and we're really excited about that. Our camp offerings are really spectacular. Um, we also have... Um, walking tours for anybody every Thursday um, in the afternoon, starting around 5, 5.30. Uh, we have three different types of walking tours and they rotate every Thursday. So right before you go out to dinner on your Thursday night in downtown Naperville, do a walk with us and learn a little bit about Naperville history. We have a west side walking tour. We have an east side walking tour that's called Town and Gown. And then we also have an architecture walking tour that those are um, really popular for us on Thursdays. Um, we're also having a couple other things going on in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, one is a volunteer open house, April 24th. Uh, you know, we, we really rely on volunteers at Napier Settlement and um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's something where you can feel more connected to, to one of your favorite places, Naper Settlement, and you can be a part of some of the things that go on. And you can volunteer in a variety of ways. You can volunteer for events, you can volunteer for uh, curatorial work, you can volunteer in the archive, you can volunteer for um, programming and giving tours. So there's lots of different ways that you can um, be, be part of Naper Settlement in a, in a, in a deeper way. We also have something that we're um, doing our inaugural Pine Craig Games um, this year. That's May 22nd. And Pine Craig Games is sort of a nod to Scottish history in honor of the Martin family and especially Carolyn Martin Mitchell, um, uh, the greatest philanthropist in Naperville's history. And Pine Craig Games um, that Sunday afternoon is going to be so fun. We're going to have a Pine Box Derby uh, um, race uh, competition. We're going to have miniature golf. We're going to have Scottish dancing. We're going to have a shortbread baking contest. So we're really bringing out our, our Scottish spirit there with Pine Craig Games in May. We also have, of course, our regular history speaks and our movie discussion. We're doing a movie discussion about Raisin in the Sun this um, next month, which is going to be really interesting with a professor from DePaul. And um, just loads and loads of other things uh, going on. There's always something going on, no matter uh, how old you are or what your interest is. And I'll um, I'll add two things to that. One is um, is really the magnificent team that we have in our learning experience department. 
Uh, one of the things that we have is, I think, what do we have three teachers now, one of which has, I think, 15 years of classroom experience. And they team up with our museum uh, experts like Jean and our curators and registrars. And so they put these programs together and what comes the output is just truly amazing and award-winning, by the way, um, award-winning programming. And so the quality, whether it is the summer camp or whether it's the history speak, the quality of the programming is uh, absolutely exceptional. Um, and then of course, we also have our events, you know, the neighbor nights and the October fests and, and, uh, and, and so on. There is really uh, so much to do. And when you become a member, um, all of these benefits are part of that membership. So you can register early for the camps. Um, you don't pay admission to go to the neighbor nights, um, things like that. It's, it's actually a pretty darn good deal. Um, and I, I, I encourage everyone um, to come and be a part. You know, when Carolyn Martin Mitchell provided the land to the city um, as trustees, one of the things that she said is that she wanted her home to be a museum, that's the mansion, Pine Craig, and her orchards, which is what you all know as neighbor settlement today, to be a place to gather her community. And so when we have these events, when we have uh, the campers and the school field trips on these orchards, um, we know that we're doing right by her, uh, by, by her in terms of what she wanted and expected uh, to be the future of, um, of her perpetual charitable trust. Right, that membership deal too, Raina, I'm glad you brought it up because you get quite the deal for a membership at Neighbor Settlement. Six Neighbor Nights, Oktoberfest, All Hallows Eve, Howlin' at the Moon, Treasures Magazine, it goes on and on. Plus that feeling that you're a part of something um, on, a, on a more profound way, um, something in your community that you can be a part of. So that's really important. Now, I, I know we're at the hour, but maybe I could ask just one or two more questions since sure. we have you. Um, I mean, since, since you all are the experts and, and really know neighbor settlement inside out, I, I would love to know what, what is your favorite part about it? Like, is there is there maybe a hidden gem that, that people sometimes miss that you think like we should really make make sure to go see? That's a really tough question. Um, I love this moment right now that the organization is in where we're really um, expanding our service levels. COVID was a really, really rough time for all of us, right? But necessity is the mother of invention is the, is the great saying. And I think through that, we found that there were so many different ways to deliver our programming. And Raina already mentioned our amazing museum educator group. And if you haven't checked it out, they have a series of Facebooks and TikTok posts that are absolutely hysterical. <laughs> and, and we are getting so much attention over some of these because they're just it's thinking about history, but it's thinking about history in a fun and maybe a little bit off kilter way. And I think for me that that's one of the really special moments. Um, and then another one is the opportunity now. So our mission changed in 2006 and it really set us up to tell the 20th and 21st century um, story of the community. And now that we're in the meat, what I like to think of as the meat and potatoes of that, we're actually doing the work and doing the scholarship. And now we're going to start sharing the content um, for me. So that wasn't one. For me, that was, that, that was two, two aspects of, of who we are as a museum and where we're going and um, how history is messy, um, but it also can be amazingly um, 
um, fun and engaging. It's it's all of those things. It it's complicated and um, and it's rich. Yeah, and I would totally concur with that. I would add the integrity of the work that we're doing right now is incredible. Um, I've worked for other historical organizations and other cultural institutions, and I am so excited about working at Neighbor Settlement. I've been here since September of 2019, and the integrity of the work that's being produced out of Neighbor Settlement is incredibly exciting for me as a public historian and somebody who works in history. But also, I have a confession, I grew up in Naperville too, uh, I didn't expect to work in, in my hometown, you know, but that is delightful to me um, because I have this kind of personal connection with these stories at a level that that um, is really, really fascinating to me. But the work and the, the, the things we're putting out there, um, the projects we're putting out there and what's to come is so exciting because as we start to digitize our collection, and democratize all of these materials, there's about 25 PhD dissertations oh, sitting in our least. archive easily, easily with the level of things we can expose to people and have them research uh, um, for us. So that that's, that's truly exciting to me. So I will tell you, um, those are all super exciting things, but I, I'm gonna tell you from the, non-museum expert, here are the things I love. Um, I love the mansion and I'll tell you why. I know that today we look at it and we go, oh my gosh, it's really not that big anyway, right? There's houses in Naperville that might be that much bigger. But when you look at the house, when it was being built was right around the time of the whole industrial revolution. And it went through firsts. Um, whether you're talking about, you know, things that we take for granted today, like indoor plumbing um, or uh, electricity or a telephone in the house. Uh, today, there are generations that wouldn't even understand that, right? But when you're looking at that phone on that wall, that was the marvel of the time for an entire era. It wasn't just for our community, it was for our nation, it was for our world. The way that we were, so when you look at that mansion, you know, you really look at it as a, as a technological advancement of that early part of the 19th century. So for me, that's a whole lot, a lot of fun. I, the other part is, I, I, I love to be in the mansion, honestly, because Carolyn Martin Mitchell was, a force to reckon with. You know, this woman lived at a time when women were supposed to sit, be proper, get married, not say anything other than have children. And she and her sisters built a business that was all male dominated. It was, it was a brick and tile business, think about this. And I can only imagine how many times she was told to sit down and be quiet and you didn't tell Carolyn Martin Mitchell to sit down and be quiet. Um, so you can just, you could, you could feel that when you're in that mansion. That's part of what I love. The other thing I, is, is I really love to just walk around because you can, if you think of those buildings as people, you think about how much they lived, right? You have a building like the Pawpaw House and it was the stagecoach and we were a small settlement and that's where the mail came in and maybe you wouldn't get mail for another five months because it had to come from Europe or if the ship didn't make it, you know, it'll be a year until you get your next piece of mail. And that's where it went to. And, you know, from, from, from there, you can see the movements in the 1960s to save our church or, you see these buildings that they lived through World War II, they lived through the Vietnam War, they lived um, through miniskirts and civil rights. And, you know, and so when you just walk around and you think about them as people, I just want to sit and ask them. And I'll tell you the third one that I love. And this one is not as accessible to the public, 
But I, I love to go to our care and storage facility. I could just sleep there. The 80,000 artifacts, we have everything from literally cars, wagons, to the beads that Joseph Naper used to trade with the Potawatomi Indians. And you have uh, the, the uniforms from soldiers of World War I, and you have wedding dresses from the last century and from the 1990s. And you start looking at that and you see almost like our entire city just start to come alive and make sense in a different way. And, um, and, 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 you know, there's a particular, there's a particular carriage that I happen to love and I will negotiate to be able to sit on it before I retire. Cause nobody lets me sit on it. Look at this. See, they're shaking their heads already, but there is just, it all just comes uh, alive in a, <laughs> I'm sneaking in there. Um, it comes alive in such a, in, in such a, a, a beautiful way the story of our town is living and breathing every day in that place plus where else can you learn how to blacksmith that's right and our blacksmith <laughs> he makes classes roses. are always full our so, blacksmith classes are full yeah yeah i'd love to add one i'd like to add on to um to what Raina just said and it, it's a plus it's an and um i think that right now also in this moment We've always had a richness of our collections, um, as Raina has really expressed so well. And I think that I like to describe museums as, as um, icebergs, right? You only see the very tip of the collection at any one moment in time. But we've recently brought in, um, I think, uh, artifacts and collection items that would really surprise people. We have the Tuk Tuk from the Patel Brothers um, opening. We have Naperville's first SWAT vehicle and we will be working with the police department around um, what that meant and uh, what, what the, you know, the history of policing, we're, we're working with them on that. And then at the same time, we're also still a repository of Naperville's early stories. Um, Jennifer Reichert, who was essentially the adopted daughter of Arnie Maceer, um, donated the entire collection um, from that family, the Maceer family collection, which is an internationally significant World War II story. And so when we talk about what we're going to be able to do in the future, we're only in the beginning stages of planning what we can do with that rich archive from Arnie and his, the legacy from Arnie, his family, his two brothers, the story that is to be told about uh, World War II and veterans and um, trauma of being a POW and, and coming back and only 40 years later being able to tell your story. So I think that the what the future holds for us also um, is just open. There's just so much. So um, this has been a really enjoyable exercise. So thanks for asking that question. And ladies, this was wonderful. I, I really enjoyed this. One thing we didn't really talk about at all was just what an economic uh, engine and powerhouse mm -hmm. neighbor settlement is for for our area and that's because it brings so many people outside of our community into into Naperville into neighbor settlement. Um, but even within the 41st district where neighbor settlement is right in the middle of it, you know, I think sometimes we we maybe uh, take for granted this this um, jewel that we have right in the middle of, of Naperville. Um, you know, I, I grew up here too, and I remember going to Naperville settlement every single year. It's <laughs> one of our field trips. And um, I, I think you have really shown us that it, you know, they, we we can't take neighbor settlement for granted that uh, you are not staying still that you're always moving forward and you're bringing so many wonderful changes and and bringing so many new exhibits um, Raina 
Donna, Jean, I mean, thank you so much for, for sharing all of this with us, um, for sharing all these, these upcoming events. Um, and, and our office is, is so excited about collaborating with you and working with you to serve our community and, and to, to make sure that, that all of this is known. Um, you know, I want to wrap this up and just, and just thank everyone who took the time to join us this evening. If, if you have any questions about tonight's presentation or um, if you have any questions about uh, services that, that our 41st district can, can offer, please make, make sure to contact us. Uh, you can con contact us at info at 